We are now at chapter 18 and we have been talking in the recent meetings about a lot about the gunas. In the last couple of chapters we went into great detail into how almost everything can be seen from the perspective of the gunas and can be understood to be sattvic, rajasic or tamasic. We continue with this understanding of the world around us. The last week we covered uh, things like uh, knowledge, the kinds of knowledge and uh, kinds of action. And now we speak about the one who acts. Karta is the one who acts. The one who is performing an action is known as Karta. So here too, there are three kinds. So when you perform any action, you as a person also um, have are of three types. So that was the earlier one. Yes. Verse 26 to 28. Liberated from attachment, not uttering I, endowed with the power to sustain and enthuse, unaffected in fulfillment or failure, such an actor is said to be sattvic. Attached, desirous of the fruit of action, greedy, inclined to violence, impure, possessed by exhilaration and depression, such an actor is said to be rajasic. Not joined in yoga, unrefined, unbending, a rogue, harming others, lazy, always depressed, a procrastinator, such an actor is said to be tamasic. So if you consider your actions, contemplate about them, think about your actions and see what kind of actions they are. You may notice that you as a person, when you perform those actions, also have a certain mood or a certain type of being at that point of time. This can be considered in the sense to be general. There are people whose activity is generally tamasic in nature and others who are generally sattvic in nature. But you may have certain moments when you are more tamasic or more sattvic. If you perform action in a way that you harm others or you're lazy, <clears throat> there's a tendency to push away things. Then the performer is considered to be tamasic. And we have all seen these kind of people and we have all had phases in our own lives where we <clears throat> have behaved like this or acted like this. Remember that when we read these things, it is not for us to look at others and surpass judgment on them <clears throat> and say, oh, this person is tamasic or this person is rajasic. Rather, it is for you to examine your own thoughts, your own actions and consider, is this rajasic? Is this tamasic? And these will help you contemplate on your own actions. If you want to do something because you're just greedy, because you just want a reward, this is definitely being rajasic. If you're motivated by the fruit and not the joy of doing a certain action, it's definitely a very rajasic approach. If you have a tendency to be very excited about something and then fall into a kind of a depression about it. You know, get disheartened. 
this too is a Rajasat trait. You have all seen such people or you may have experienced it yourself. You know, you get very excited about a certain project or a certain new activity and then we lose interest after a while. Let's take sports, for example, or physical fitness. People make very major um, resolutions and they put a lot of effort and they're very excited about it and they, they get very excited to do things and they do it for a while and then they just lose interest. They cannot sustain it. This is a Rajasic person. And the Sattvic person is completely different from these. The Sattvic person is not so attached to the fruit itself, the fruit of the actions, and has a staying power, has a stamina, has enthusiasm. He can sustain something for a longer period of time. You can now well imagine that something like meditation, something where you need to continue to do this for very, very long periods of time, over years, it's very difficult for somebody with a rajasic nature to sustain this kind of sadhana or practice. They get very excited whether it's a new tradition, a new teacher, new practices, they do it with great enthusiasm for a short while, then they lose interest and they drop it. A sattvic person would not drop it. He knows it's difficult, he knows it's challenging, but he will sustain that effort. He will keep on doing this. And even though he may fail, he will not be unduly affected by it. I say unduly and not completely unaffected because even though at some level he may feel, yes, I didn't succeed in something, he knows that he needs to keep doing it. He needs to keep doing it at some point of time. He will experience also some positive experiences or some kind of success. Such a person does not keep saying I. This is an important point here. This does not mean literally that you don't say the word I. In the language that we use, it's totally normal to use the word I. And it sounds odd if you try to communicate with somebody by dropping the word I. What it means is that the focus is not always about I. The focus is always expansive. Such a person, a sattvic person, thinks about others, in, is very inclusive, includes others. And even though he may be the motivating factor in a certain project or, or within a team, he would not be the kind of person who is there merely because he wants credit, praise or promotion. He would be thinking of a higher cause. So that kind of person is very sattvic. You can say that this person is not individualistic. He's inclusive. So these are the three kinds of performers of action. Anybody has questions or wants to comment on this?
just as an afterthought, it occurs to me also to say that the very first, the verse here, 26, which listed some qualities, sattvic qualities, these could be regarded as desirable for any seeker. If you want to be a sincere, genuine seeker, if you want to progress in sadhana, in practice, then definitely you should cultivate these qualities to be able to maintain your enthusiasm, to be able to sustain your energy when you take up a task, not to get unduly affected when you do not succeed or even when you do succeed, not to be too attached to the result and not to be too individualistic. Such a person will definitely succeed in sadhana and will progress, will attain. Okay, I will go on to verses 29 to 32. And just as we have been studying the gunas from different perspectives, such as action, the karta, the performer of action, knowledge, um, duties, different kinds of duties. Similarly, now we are talking about buddhi. Verses 29 to 32. Now here the threefold division of intelligence and sustenance by their gunas, being taught in entirety and separately, O Arjuna. Ordinance and prohibition, what ought to be done or not be done, dangerous and non-dangerous, bonded and liberation. The intelligence that knows these, O son of Pritha, is the sattvic one. That by which one knows incorrectly virtue and vice, what ought to be done or ought not to be done, O son of Pritha, is Rajasik. That intelligence which covered by darkness leaves vice to be virtue and all the matters opposite of their reality O son of Pitta is Tamasik. The word intelligence here is referring to Buddhi. And this is a very difficult word to translate into English. And generally the translation used has been intelligence. However, this does not have much to do with our modern understanding of intelligence. Mostly when we refer to an intelligent person, we may be talking about his IQ, we may be talking about somebody who is well-educated, we may be speaking about somebody who is, who is um, clever in the sense of, you know, speaking or knows a lot of things. So there are different understandings of the word intelligence, even in our day-to-day -day life. Here, the word used is buddhi. And buddhi is a very, very specific, clearly defined term. It is that aspect of your mind that judges, that makes decisions. It's the closest part to pure consciousness. In fact, it's the most sattvic part of your mind. Yet, this buddhi has now been classified as tamasic, rajasic and sattvic. That may seem odd to you. It is not. There is only one buddhi and that buddhi is nature. By nature, it is brilliant. It is pure. But 
due to the cloudiness of the mind, the impurities of the mind, this buddhi cannot see through the mind very clearly. When the nature of the mind is very tamasic and the buddhi cannot see through clearly, cannot take good decisions, then we refer to this buddhi as tamasic. When the clouded mind is so clouded by darkness, is so tamasic, the word tamas means darkness, it's so dark that you actually believe vice to be virtue. And you think of virtue as vice. That is a truly tamasic buddhi or a truly tamasic person. And you may wonder, who thinks like this? Well, if you think about it carefully, there are many criminals in the world who are doing terrible things, have no regrets about what they're doing. And in fact, they think they're terribly clever if they manage to successfully get away with a criminal act. Let's take, for example, economic offenders or those who are offend, uh, performing, um, you know, hacking and things like this and they get away with their criminal activity. Many of them think they were really clever. They are happy about this. And if you come across to such a person as too upright, too virtuous, they laugh at you and say, oh, how, how foolish are you? Who thinks like that these days? You're too good for this world. So they consider a person who is good, morally upright, a person who has values, to be stupid. This is not uncommon and this is not restricted to modern times. There were always people like this. And such a buddhi is considered to be tamasic. Those on the other hand who are not clear about what is right and what is wrong, what should be done and what should not be done, they have a rajasic buddhi. You can say that they're confused. They're not clear about what is right and wrong. They would perform a virtuous act and then think, hmm, did I do the right thing? They would suddenly have doubts about it. Or they would perform an incorrect act or have do something wrong and believe that they did something right. They are shifting, they are not sure, they are uncertain, there's a lot of doubt. And such a buddhi is rajasic. The finest, of course, is the sattvic buddhi. This buddhi is extremely sharp. This knows very clearly, this buddhi, what should be done and what should not be done. It knows very well what is dangerous and what is not dangerous. And it knows what is leading to bondage and what leads to liberation. <clears throat> All the action that we perform has to be decided upon. Somebody has to decide, should I do it, should I not do it? Is this right or wrong? And the buddhi within us makes these decisions. Mostly, these decisions are almost instant. With meditation, 
you can purify your mind so that your buddhi can see through with greater clarity. And that process of purification and being able to see through clarity is also called sharpening of the buddhi or creating or polishing your buddhi so that eventually the buddhi becomes more and more sattvic in nature. Think of it as a mirror, you know, which is not even polished. It's got a lot of dust on it. And as you clean it, your reflection becomes clearer. You see yourself. And you, you polish it, it really shines, and it gives you a really sharp reflection. So this is how you need to clear away the impurities from the mind and sharpen your buddhi and make your buddhi sattvic. This is a process that may take years for some and some may be able to do that in a few years. So the time how long it takes depends on the effort you put, depends on many other factors. Any questions about this, about buddhi? Any comments about it? It's a very important uh, point to understand. Everybody seems to be clear. Good. So you can see we are going now in the direction of finer direction of aspects of sadhana, of practice, you know, of what we need. It's very clear now that we need a sattvic buddhi. What else do we need? Verses 33 to 35. That undeviating steadfastness, dhirti, which sustains activities of mind, prana and senses through yoga, is opratha sattvic one. That by which one sustains virtue, desire, worldly success, desiring fruits incidentally in the context, that steadfastness or dhirti is rajasic. That by which someone devoid of intuitive wisdom does not give up sleep, fear, grief and depression, that steady fastness, O Sanapitha, is tamasic. Nudhirati, O steady fastness, is a quality that we need to achieve success in any aspect of life. Another word for dhirati is sankalp or determination, or stamina, so that you can sustain something over a longer period of time. Energy, enthusiasm. So these are different words for the same thing. Patience, staying power. What is a sattvic form of determination? that which sustains activities related to yoga or yoga sadhana. It sustains activities of the mind, of the pranas, the senses through yoga. And this is very sattvic. It requires a different kind of determination to practice yoga, yoga sadhana. As you start going inwards, you realize that it's very different from performing worldly activities. It requires 
a completely different approach. Our minds have been trained to function in the external world. Through education, through schooling system, we have been trained to work in the external world, to be successful in the external world. But we have no idea how to explore our own minds, how to train our senses, how to, to work at the level of prana. We simply do not know. And this requires a great deal of determination and, and willpower to go through this because it's a completely new terrain. And it is like nothing you have done before. It's nothing you can grasp. It's not like an object that you can grasp. So it requires a very, very different kind of steadiness to go through this. That determination through which we acquire worldly success, virtue, desire, all this, is Rajasik. Why is even virtue coming under Rajasik? Because virtue, actions which are virtuous, this comes in the domain of morals and values. This is not necessarily yoga. Yoga is not about being a good person morally or having high values. True attainment of yoga is going beyond the mind completely and becoming a witness. So virtues, desires, all this comes under worldly success and is rajasic in nature. So if you have that kind of energy to do something out in the world, you make plans to be successful at your own little project, whatever that project may be, you're successful in it. It requires a certain stamina. It requires a certain determination. And that determination is rajasic. Let's say you want to be physically fit. That's your project. It requires a certain stamina to do that over a period of time. And that stamina that you require is Rajasik. Or let's take the example of you want to learn a musical instrument. You don't play anything and you decided, okay, I think I want to do something different. I want to learn how to play a musical instrument. And then you need to sustain that over a period of time. It requires a lot of determination. But the most interesting is the tamasic form of de determination. This is very unusual in the sense that it may sound odd to have a tamasic form of of determination, but it is actually more common than we imagine. Somebody who is not willing to give up his fears, to give up his sorrows, to give up his own misery, is, has a tamasic steady fastness. You hold on to something. So there's a certain energy that is required to hold on to your own misery. And that is a tamasic one. Very often people say, oh, I can't meditate because, you know, all my fears come up. I say, yes, you observe your fears and let them go. Don't, don't get so involved with them. Don't get so influenced by them. They're not able to do that because you don't know how to. You keep getting involved in them. What's happening is that you've, you're holding on to that. 
It may sound paradoxical. Why would anybody want to hold on to grief, to suffering, to fear? They do that. And that is why they're not able to be happy or successful. The many decisions we take that are based on fear, which are not helping our development. If you have an opportunity to do something interesting, exciting, going abroad, doing something different, you're afraid. You're afraid to do it. You, you don't know what, what will happen in the future. You don't know whether you're going to be successful or not. And that fear is so strong that you'd rather be where you are and be miserable than try something new, different, and be happy. So this is uh, the dhirti, which is very tamasic. Any questions? Any comments? Dhirati is very important for us. We need it for success in every aspect of life. So, do contemplate on this idea of tamasic dhirati or steadfastness, we all have a bit of that. We are not willing sometimes to let go of things. Atikaji? Yes? Um, I had a question at Nisha. Yeah, yeah. I need you. Um, is the progression, would you say, um, is tamasic to rajasic? Or hmm. Can someone skip the rajasic and is it different maybe like in different domains of life? Definitely one, it's not a progression, it's not always a progression. It can shift from tamas to sattva as well. It's, it's very interesting actually that tamas and sattva are in a way closer to each other than rajas is. Because tamas is the flip side of sattva. If you're not very sharp, you can actually mistake tamas for being sattva. For example, if somebody just sits around, <laughs> from a certain perspective, it can look like, oh, this person is so calm and balanced and peaceful. But in reality, he could be just dull and depressed. And that would be tamasic and not sattvic. So both of them are very close. There could be a progression as well from going from tamas into rajas, where a very dull and uh, lazy kind of heavy person moves on to becoming much more active, energetic, and then eventually seeks to balance these two aspects out, and that would lead to sattva. So these are aspects we see in our minds in every domain of life. And if we study ourselves, you will notice there will be times when you feel more tamasic, there are times you feel rajasic, there are times you feel more sattvic. And that is the play of the gunas. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The tamasic dhirati reminded me, reminded me of one example which is, which is quite interesting and that is of anger. Very often when we experience anger, or sadness, deep sadness due to loss, for example, 
Very often we are not able to let go. We fall into some sort of a tamasic state and we are not able to let go. We don't want to let go. For example, the loss of a dear one, a beloved one. We think that if we would let go, it would be somehow like betraying the person. So you actually cultivate that attachment, you cultivate that sorrow, you know. And in society, it is accepted. So, Rajas, Tamas and Sattva are very interesting qualities and they can be studied everywhere. And now one of the most interesting ones is the different types of happiness, the three types of happiness. Some of us have a certain idea of happiness and that may be if I get a certain job, I'm going to be happy. If I get um, married, I'll be happy. If I get a child, I'll be happy. So we have a certain idea of happiness. What is perspective of happiness from the Bhagavad Gita? Verses 36 to 39 explain this. Now hear from me the three kinds of happiness in which one delights through practice and definitely finds the end of sorrow. That which initially is like poison but is in effect like elixir, that happiness is called sattvic, born of the pleasantness of one's intelligence. That which appears initially like elixir through the union of senses and their objects, but in effect is like a poison. That happiness is considered rajasic. That happiness which both initially and in the end result dilutes oneself, arising from sleep, laziness and inattention, that is tamasic. Okay, so so uh, I was just looking at some of the comments. I was not sure Matthias uh, what Matthias was trying to say here. But okay. Um Three kinds of happiness really are about our approach to life. Very often we get fascinated by things which come easy. And it may seem wonderful in the beginning. Success is very heady and you feel great about it. And you may experience when you meet a new person, you fall in love and everything is wonderful. And then what happens? And over a period of time, instead of it getting better, it seems to get worse. So initially, it was elixir, it was honey, it was nectar. But then it gets worse and worse. And you know, all of you know perhaps, of relationships when it's so terrible, they are just toxic. And all you want to do is get out of it. And that is basically like poison. It may seem certain things which come very easily. Oh, this is good, you know, this is easy stuff. But beware when it comes to easy. On the other hand, there are things like sadhana, which are very hard in the beginning. It requires a lot of effort, a lot of learning, a lot of unlearning. You have to hear very bitter things from your teacher. You have to work on yourself. When you start meditation, you see qualities in you which you don't like. It may seem terrible in the beginning. And you ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I really getting anything out of this? 
but then you begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel and things get better and better it gets joyous it gets wonderful and you begin to find out that we are all connected to each other and you do not feel lonely ever again you can you become a witness but until you get there you have to go through that poison that poison where all your impurities and negativities come forward and it seems to be endless but when it is over then the good part starts so there is a lot of activity that we go through in life or projects we have in life that when you want real success it may be very hard initially so for example today i've been using the example of fitness uh, to become physically fit to lose weight or um, think of any project that that you something you want to do and you see that initially it's very hard you put in a lot of effort and there may be times you want to give up and you hang in there and only when you hang in there for a longer time that you begin to see also the positive results most people give up taking a simple example of weight loss you know i'm calling it a simple example but in fact it's very challenging for most people to lose weight and it's very hard initially it's it is requires a lot of mental strength to go through that and as you begin to see the positive effects it gets better and it gets easier most people would like to get a easy solution aren't there any pills that we can pop so that we lose weight that's why there are a lot of fraudulent methods being sold tablets pills being sold where i don't know whether they work but to me they sound um somehow like a scam and this approach is where you will find sometimes in the internet people selling you all sorts of things success in 7 days you know and these kind of banners come from the fact that people always want quick solutions get rich in one year become a millionaire in one year i'm sure you all have seen such kind of lines somewhere or the other which is what makes us all want to play the lottery you know get rich easy and that is the idea of something which seems very sweet initially but turns into poison take the example of medicine it's bitter but it's good for you and take the example of things like alcohol and other rich foods which are tasty but they are poisonous it's very easy to take all these rich tasty foods but you will have a serious health problem very soon but when you eat things which are balanced healthy you need to chase cultivate a taste for these things and that seems very hard to some people and what about that kind of happiness which starts and ends in delusion this comes from excessive sleep laziness and attention this is tamas
this is really these verses are about one's approach to life and always beware when things appear almost a little bit too easy. Okay. Any thoughts about this? Any questions? Okay, verse 40. There is no essence in the earth, in heaven, or even among the gods that may be free of these nature born gunas. We have actually said this in uh, the last few sessions repeatedly that everything is the domain of gunas because gunas is basically another word for prakriti or shakti. It is all of life and these, this life, this, this world is an interplay of the three gunas. If the gunas would remain fixed, there would be no world the way we know it. There is a continuous interplay between the three and it keeps changing, it keeps moving. This movement causes this world around us to appear the way it does. So everything is part of the gunas, including the gods. The gods are not beyond the gunas. The only thing that is beyond the gunas is your consciousness itself. That is divinity or pure consciousness. When you are established in that, you can sit back and enjoy the play of the gunas. You are no longer bound by it. It doesn't mean you do not watch it. If you are a Jivan Mokt, you observe these gunas. And you enjoy that play. This is 41 to 44. I hope that these are not going to get controversial. So let's dive in. Verses 41 to 44 say, talk about society. The actions of the Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras, O Skosha of enemies, are properly divided by the Gunas born of the primordial nature of Prakriti. Peace, control, ascetism, purity, forgiveness, simplicity, knowledge, realization, and positive belief are the actions of a Brahman produced by nature. Bravery, confidence, steadfastness, dexterity, not escaping a battle, charity, expressing sovereign power, are the actions of a Kshatriya, born of nature. Farming, husbandry and trade are the actions of a Vaishya, born of nature, and the actions of a Shudra, consisting of service, are also born of nature. I will continue to read the following verses and then comment on them, because they are related. Verses 45 and 46. A person attains perfection when absorbed and delighting in his own act. Here how one who is content in his own actions finds perfection. Worshipping him with his act, he from whom begins all activity of beings, by whom all this is spanned and pervaded, a child of Manu finds perfection. <clears throat> So let's come back to the classification of society. Hindu 
society or Indian society, to be more clear, has always been divided into Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Sudras. This classification or what is in sociology called stratification of society was also found here in Europe. Here in Europe it was known as the estates. There was the clergy, the nobility, the merchants and traders and then the ones who were without an estate, the, the serfs, I think they were called. So this classification or stratification has not been just limited to India. Why did it exist? This stratification actually reflects our nature. Some of us are by nature more sattvic. We are better trained, have a sense of qualities like forgiveness and simplicity, lovers of knowledge, having a very positive approach. These are the qualities of sattva and they are assigned to one known as a Brahmin. What has happened, however, is that this stratification became rigid. It was not about birth. It's not like the son of Brahmin naturally is a Brahmin. If you study the qualities of the person, it may happen that the son of a Brahmin may have completely different qualities. Maybe he has the qualities of a Kshatriya. What is the quality of a Kshatriya? Kshatriya is a warrior or the class of royalty whose job was to rule administration taking care of the people and for that you need to be brave you need confidence you need to be steady fast skilled you can't be cowardly you have to defend your people you have to protect them you have to have a charitable nature generous nature and these are the qualities of a Kshatriya. Is it not possible that the son of a Brahmin may have these qualities? Or is it not possible that the son of a king or a daughter of a king has qualities of asceticism, purity, forgiveness, simplicity? It's well possible. However, unfortunately with time, this stratification became rigid. It was not meant to be like that. It was to help people understand themselves and to find their calling in life. If today you are very entrepreneurial by nature, you have a sense of business, you know how to you know, be creative, you have many ideas, then you are a business person. You would be called a Vaishya. But if you were born into a Brahmin family earlier, that would not be good. You would not be allowed to do that because they would say you are going below your station of life. And they would not be allowed to do that. The result is that such a person would be utterly miserable in his life because he would not be allowed to do what his innate nature would like to do. What if you come from a farming background, but you want to study? You enjoy learning, you enjoy knowledge, but you are maybe the only child or the only uh, one who can take over the farm, so you packed off to the fields and made to work in the fields, you're utterly unhappy because you would rather study, rather read books and, and 
take up some profession where you work more with the intellect. So you can see how a knowledge-oriented person cannot be forced into a job which is more um, physical oriented, which requires different kind of skills like farming or trading. You cannot put somebody who is by nature a leader, a Kshatriya, he's a leader and then you tell him you have to study all the time and you make him into a lawyer who has to then sit with a bunch of files. That doesn't work either. So if you follow your natural innate qualities, you go with the flow and not against your own nature, then you will find contentment, you will find joy in your occupation, you will find joy in that which you do. Then whatever you do, you will be passionate about it. You will love doing it. What has happened today is that a lot of people who would be maybe better off having skilled or semi-skilled jobs like a carpenter, a hairdresser, a mechanic are forced by the parents into studies so that they become doctors and lawyers and engineers even though they don't really have the nature for it, the aptitude for it, nor do they have the interest or the inclination. And this causes a great deal of tension. You're against the flow, you're going against your natural flow. You're putting a, maybe a person who is rajasic into an activity that is sattvic, or you're putting somebody who is by nature Sattvic into an activity which is tamasic by nature. And that does not work. You're going completely against the flow of nature. The moment you restore that flow, energy will flow freely, then what surfaces is love, passion for what you do. And whatever you do, you will do completely with your full heart. And when you do something with your full heart and joyfully, it's an act of worship. And you find perfection. Perfection is just that feeling you have, you're doing it because you love to do it. You may not even think about the reward. A lot of creative people are thinking in this approach. They are so passionate about their, whether it is music, art, theatre, they enjoy it so much, they are not thinking about, will I become successful? Will I earn money out of it? And if they don't do their passion, they may be quite miserable. <clears throat> so these, this is about going with your natural flow, the flow of the gunas. Okay, so any comments, any suggestions, thoughts, ideas, opinions, <laughs> anything you'd like to share? And in that case, <clears throat> I just realized that we are already done, um, the one hour, and of course we will continue next time from verse 50 onwards then, and then we only have another 25 verses to go and we'll be done with Bhagavad Gita, we would probably end next uh, session and if not next session the, the one after that uh, maximum two more sessions to go okay i hope everybody has a nice weekend 
Bye bye everyone. Bye Shibu. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.